We might make a start. I'm just going to pray for, for our gathering. Lord God, we just uh, lift your name on high this morning. And we thank you that you brought us here on this beautiful summer's day. We pray uh, bless this time of worship and fellowship together. In Jesus' name. Amen.
extended just for a little while. Welcome everyone to Daniel Church of Christ. Uh, this week we've got a special surprise from Paul Briscoe, who's going to be up here shortly to share a communion, but he's actually written a book. And he's just printed uh, two copies, and one copy is going to be uh, living here at the library, but anyone can borrow, feel free to borrow it. It's on the book of Daniel, his life, work, ministry, and message. It's actually uh, a study companion, so you can go through the entire book of Daniel and go through, go through a passage by a passage, and it's got reflections on each of uh, those passages. So what a wonderful resource um, to have in, in this church. So thanks, Paul, for keeping us in the uh, Just one other announcement. Catherine and I will be away the next two weeks. So we might be around uh, on uh, next Sunday or the following Sunday, and we'll be away for, the, for those weeks. So um, we probably won't be answering emails. <laughs> We might answer a phone call if it's an emergency, but otherwise uh, the church will be in the uh, capable hands of the elders. And also we have uh, two, well we've got one guest preacher next week, uh, our friend, my friend James Ailey, and he'll be talking on the fall, because we're going through God's big story, and so he's covering the fall, and then the following week Mark Rayleigh will, will um, follow up on that, on that theme as well. So it should be a great couple of weeks. Sorry we're missing it, but uh, we, we need some time away as a family. So thank you. So I'm going to invite uh, Mark and Amanda up again to sing uh, a worship song. Thank you.
church. Maybe the one thing I could mention is that when I joined this church uh, some time ago, I was about halfway through that book. <laughs> and uh, it's taken me around about nine years to write. Uh, because when I started it, I was still working. Got a bit more time to do it when I was retired. But it's still taken uh, quite a length of time. Uh, and I could mention also that in my younger days, I was a bookbinder. So it uh, gave me the ability to find that book when I'd written it. I was pleased about that. Is that all? Is that better? Sorry. I hope you heard me. I don't want to repeat all that. We come to a time of communion to share with the elements and to share with our Lord in everything that he has done for us, everything that he promises us, everything that we can enjoy as Christian people. But there can be times in the Christian life when we fail to grasp the wickedness of sin. Or if you like, the seriousness of sin. King David poured out his heart to God in a soul-searching prayer in Psalm 51. And he says these words in verses 3 and 4. For I am so ashamed. I feel such pain and anguish within me. I can't get away from the sting of my sin against you, Lord. Everything I did, I did right in front of you, for you saw it all. Against you, and you above all, have I sinned. Everything you say to me is infallibly true. David reveals the anguish of his soul over his sin. All of us need to do this. Sin is known by many names, names that are used these days so that we don't have to use the word sin. But it is still sin. And it separates us from a holy God. We want to look up into the face of Jesus. We want to say, I love you. But instead, we find ourselves so often saying, my sin is ever before me. Satan became God's enemy when he allowed sin to enter his heart. This is our danger too, when we let Satan get the get in the way of the relationship that we want to have with God. Satan is vicious, cruel, violent, arrogant, but his most subtle weapon against people is ignorance. Deception. So we take on a frame of mind, pretend he doesn't exist. Just ignore him. Or we have a don't care attitude. Don't concern yourself with such a notion. It's not that important. When we have thoughts and feelings of this nature, we have played right into his hand. This is exactly what he wants. Just ignore him. If we live our lives this way, even for one day, he's won. But to make him lose every time, we need to keep short accounts with the Lord. And what I mean by that is to confess and forsake sin every time 
each and every time that it comes to our, our attention and we become aware of it. Because it's in those moments that our unity and our fellowship and our peace with the Lord has been shattered. And that brings us, my friends, to this time. Right here, right now, with the elements that we hold in our hand. This is where we can confess and forsake the sin. We can write the rules and we can cancel the account. And best of all, we can restore the peace and the unity that our souls pray for with the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that one? Yes. Amen. Jesus waits right here, right now, to help to make this happen. He's our Redeemer. He's our sacrifice. He's our Saviour. Psalm 51 verse 10 says, Create a clean new heart within me. Fill me with pure thoughts and holy desires, ready to please you. The rest is up to us, mate. It is my prayer that while I've been sharing with you this morning, you have done your part to restore the unity and the peace with the Lord so that now, together, we can partake of the body and blood of our Lord. Because in spite of everything that's happening, God is still in control. Amen. He still loves us. He still provided so much for our, our benefit and blessing in life. So with those thoughts in mind, um, I want to pray this prayer of thanks and praise. And most of the items that I'm going to pray about have been my personal experience in the opening days of 2021. So I hope uh, you've had similar experiences and you've got much to praise God for. But let's just come before you now as the people of God in the house of God and let's pray for you. Father God, you are creator of the earth, the earth that we live on. We thank you for the beauty and endless detail of the world that we call our home and the soil from which we draw food and nourishment. We thank you for the majestic sight of the eagle and the pelican as they glide through the air like your angels. We thank you also for the sparrows and the budgerigars that descend on our lawns and parks to survive by eating the grasses that they find appealing. Our hearts are filled with praise to you for the magnificence of the night sky with its endless array of stars that illuminate the dark expanse of the heavens above us. We praise you for the resplendent colours of endless varieties of flowers and trees around us in the parks and forests and gardens. The perfect petals of a rose show your handiwork as magnificently as the oak and the gum tree that tower above the earth. We praise you too for the wonderful variety in the animal kingdom that roam the wilderness and the wild, using their inbuilt instincts to sustain life year in and year out. Thank you, Lord, 
for the things in nature that fascinate us, enthrall us, and even confuse us, causing us to praise you more for your ingenuity and wisdom in all of life around us. We thank you, Lord, for rest and sleep, giving us refreshment and health to live and serve you. We thank you especially today for the opportunity to gather here as your people in this sanctuary and praise you for the redemption that we have through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. With thanks and praise, we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Paul, for that beautiful prayer about creation. We're talking about God's big story, covering uh, the big, big story of the Bible over the next few weeks. We're still in creation. And a girl one day went to her mother and asked her, um, how were people created? And the mother replied, well, God created human beings on this earth a long time ago. And then the, the girl wanted a second opinion, so she went to her dad and asked him, how were people created? And he replied, well, we descended from monkeys. And the girl was very confused, so she went back to her mother and said, Mom, why, why did you tell me that God created people? And then Dad said, we just came from monkeys. And she replied, it's very simple. I told you about my side of the family. Your dad told you about his. So last week we looked at Genesis 1, God's big story, creation, and in the, but today we're actually going to look at Genesis 2, and I want to talk about creation and creativity, and the different ways in which God has called human beings to be creative. After all, we are made in God's image, as it says in Genesis 1. So, if we reflect God's personality and God is a creator God, it follows that we have that creative instinct within us. So, I'm going to read from Genesis 2, starting from verse 4, and this is the uh, New Living Translation. So, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just jumping to verse 15. The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may eat freely the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. And the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But still, there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord God 
took out of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the first way I want to talk about that God calls us to be created comes from uh, that verse in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and settled him in the garden of Eden to cultivate and care for it. So we heard in Genesis 1 that God created all the wild animals and the plants and everything, and there was just this wilderness. And I talked a bit about the wildness of God's creation, you know, even before man came on the scene. But then God places Adam in the garden. In other words, he, he gives him a little sort of corner of the earth to, to tend and, and cultivate and care for. And so this is God's plan, his intention for, for, for humanity to, to be able to control nature to some extent, but not, not to have the whole of the earth to, to dominate necessarily, but just a, a part of, of the earth to, to cultivate and care for. So for the first six days of creation, there's this repeated phrase in Genesis 1, there was morning and there was evening. But to the seventh day of creation, there is no end. This, it doesn't say there was an evening. And so that implies that the seventh day is still going on. That there, because God rested on the seventh day and he blessed it and he declared it holy. And so therefore it is an eternal rest. It's still, it's still going on. And the first two chapters of Genesis reveal God's ideal vision for the cosmos is a place where God lives with his partners in creation, that is, um, human beings, to rule the world. Remember last week we talked about he gave humankind dominion over the earth to rule the world in harmony forever. So the seventh day, the day of rest, is in fact the goal of creation. It's all leading to that point where God is, is going to dwell with humanity and they're going to rest and rule over the earth with him forever. And that is not to say that Adam and Eve are to be couch potatoes and, and just blob around. Not that there were couches back then. That God actually gives them work to do, but it's not the kind of work that is, um, uh, to you know, they're not toiling. They're actually, you can imagine, they would enjoy uh, tending and cultivating this, this garden that God had given them. I mean, look at the beauty of this garden. Perhaps Eden looked a little bit like this. This is um, in Canada. Although they wouldn't have had lawnmowers and hedge clippers and so on, so maybe it looked a bit wilder than this, but. Nonetheless, there was beauty and, and order that, that God intended humankind to bring uh, to his creation. And so God gives them this work to do, that they may enjoy the beauty and eat freely of the fruit on the trees and dwelling with God in complete peace. So it's important to remember this original plan that God had for humanity as we read the rest of the Bible, this theme crops up again and again. And it's good to have this in the back of our minds that this was God's original plan. The second way in which God calls us to be created is in Genesis 1 when he says to, to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, procreate, have, have babies. What a great command to have. <laughs> I'd be happy to obey that command. And many people have done that. And so the world has, has filled with, 
with, you, with human beings across the face of the earth. Adam and Eve obeyed that original command. But the command isn't just about uh, um, procreation, having children. Because in Genesis 2, we actually get a more intimate picture of what the relationship is like between men, man and woman. And Adam expresses it in this first, you could say it was the first ever love poem or love song in, uh, in Genesis 2. He says, when Eve is created out of his, his ribs, he, he wakes up from his sleep and beholds Eve and he goes, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. You can just see that desire in Adam. He's just, he's seen the animals and the birds and said to God, no, they're not going to be my helpers. And then finally, he creates Eve and, and he is just ecstatic. So this poem would later take um, more fuller expression in the Song of Songs. If you read the Song of Songs, it's full of love poems uh, between a man and a woman. And it is the most beautiful poetry, you could say, that's ever been written. I am my beloved's and he is mine. His banner over me is love. Every romantic expression within culture, from right from the, the, that first love poem, right through to Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, Right through to today when we watch romantic comedies on, at the movies. They are inspired by that original impulse within men and women to adore the other and desire them, each other, and to be one with them. And this is a God-given desire and planted within us, not simply for the purpose of procreation, having children, but an innate desire to share in an intimate relationship with a lifelong companion. And it's God's will that this intimate relationship is exclusive of all others. Although we read in the Old Testament that men had, some men had several wives, um, in the New Testament Jesus and the Apostles emphasised faithfulness to one partner alone for life. Now, the Greek word for uh, love, or romantic love, is eros, which is where we get the word erotic. Now, sadly today, erotic is often associated with um, a distorted view of sex, which leads to lust. But this was far from God's original intention for men and women, because it says at the end of Genesis 2 that the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. They were not ashamed. So erotic love between a man and a woman is a God-given gift to be enjoyed and celebrated. And it, it takes its full expression in the Bible in the Song of Songs. Interestingly, if you read the New Testament, there's not a lot of mention of erotic love. There is more of a focus on what's called agape. That's the Greek word for the love of God. And when Paul, he talks about marriage in his letter to the Ephesians, and he actually likens the love between a husband and wife, he, he says that reflects the love between Christ and his church. And so the, the intimacy of love that's created between, uh, within marriage mirrors the intimacy that we can have with God the Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. And perhaps that's why Paul could lead, quite happily lead a single life, a life of singleness and celibacy, and he actually said um, it's a completely valid alternative way of living out the Christian faith. You know, he actually said if, you, if, you, um, if you're converted to the faith, if you're single, then you can remain single. Uh, you don't have to marry. And so basically, uh, if, if we've found... If people have found Jesus, this is enough. They can expend their energy on serving God rather than on a wife or husband. That is not to say that uh, marriage is no longer relevant. Not at all. Uh, the New Testament still blesses 
marriage between a man and a woman. But what it is saying is that singleness is just as valid as, as a way of life for the Christian to follow Jesus. So the original command of God in Genesis to be fruitful and multiply in the New Covenant actually uh, refers to, can be, uh, can refer to the church being fruitful and multiplying and covering the, going to the ends of the earth, spreading the good news of the gospel. And so the church should be having babies. We should be planting churches all throughout the land. So I'd like to just mention here an important point that we so easily miss in Genesis 2. Nowhere in the creation story of man and woman does it imply that somehow the woman is less, a lesser creation than, than the man. In fact, we could say, argue the opposite, that she is the pinnacle of creation because she's the last creature that's, that God creates. But really, what is emphasised in Genesis 1 and 2 is the equality of both sexes. If you look at uh, chapter 1, verse 27, uh, it says, So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So this suggests that there are masculine and feminine qualities within God himself. But then he simply put the more masculine qualities of his nature in men and the more feminine qualities in women. But nowhere does it say that either one is above the other. But sadly, this is a radical departure from the way in which many cultures view women, including our own country. In many countries, women are treated as second-class citizens. They're not given an education, they're often not given rights to work. And even in Australia, domestic violence towards women is a major issue. And you could, there's many factors involved in that. But of course it goes back to the fall, which James is going to talk about next week. It goes back to the division that is created between men and women. But I won't talk about that now, I'll leave that for him to talk about. But if we took Genesis 1 and 2 seriously, we'd realise that men and women, God values women as much as men, that the man is to cherish the woman as he does his own body, and that God has made men and women with differences, but those differences aren't to be a source of conflict, they're meant to complement one another. Now I want to uh, put up this picture. I hope I'm not embarrassing you, Mark and Amanda. But this was the Mark and Amanda's wedding that we did here in Ju back in July, when we could only have five people at a wedding. But I just think this is a beautiful picture, uh, a lovely uh, ritual. Mark and Amanda wash one another's feet. And I just think that there's a wonderful New Testament image of, of the way men and women in marriage can, can serve one another and, and bless one another. So the third uh, and final way that I wanted to talk about uh, how God calls us to be created is in culture itself. Uh, it's interesting when uh, you could say that culture began when Adam actually named the animals because he used language he had to be creative and come up with names for all of these animals that God had created. So he was using, you could say, the right brain, the right side of his brain. Uh, but he was, he was using language, so he had to make up these names. And that was the beginning of culture, this, this, this creative impulse that God has placed within us to create works of art. To, to make things up, to use our imagination. And so we have poetry, literature, song and dance, drama, painting, pottery, sculpture, and more recently we've got film, photography and animation. And you might say, well, I'm not a creative person. Well, that's simply not true, because each and every one of us were created in God's image, so therefore 
we reflect his nature and he is a creator God. So there are different ways of being creative. You don't have to just be picking up a paintbrush or, or a pen to write. You could be creative in relationships, for example, in understanding uh, how people uh, relate to one another and coming up with creative solutions to, to maybe solve arguments. You could be creative in science or in maths. I mean, think about it. All the, the scientists that are working on the COVID vaccine at the moment, how creative they have to be in coming up with solutions to combat this virus. So the God who created something out of nothing helps us bring out new ideas um, that, and creative solutions to the world's problems. And then, of course, as a church, we have the gifts of the Spirit, which are inherently creative. So we have the gifts of prophecy, of speaking in tongues, of faith and healing, and leadership and hospitality. All of these gifts um, we are called to, to um, exercise, and Christians are needed more than ever to bear witness to the good news of God and His glory through the gifts of the Spirit and, and our creative endeavors in the world. I wanted to just ask you this question to, to think about, ponder and um, talk about with, with the person next to you just for a moment. In what area or areas is God calling you to be creative this year? And it could be anything, anything I've talked about before with I mentioned cultivation, you know, gardening. Uh, I mentioned having children. Brother Alexi are due to have a child next year. This year, sorry. They're being creative and multiplying. Uh, you might be past the child rearing stage, but there's other ways you can be creative. You can be fruitful in the gifts of the Spirit. And, and bless the church and seek to spread the good news of the gospel. You might be creative in hospitality. Hopefully this year we can have more people over to our homes. Uh, you might be creative in writing cards and letters to people. There's all sorts of ways uh, that you can be creative and, and answer that call uh, of God in your life. So why don't you just talk to uh, the person next to you, could be your husband or wife, could be uh, uh, a friend, and just spend some time uh, answering that question and then we'll just finish with a prayer at the end. Creator God, we praise you for your abundant creativity and your abundant creation. Thank you for making us in your image. Thank you for men and women and the differences you have given us. We confess that so often we allow these differences to divide us rather than appreciating the other for who they are. Grant us the grace to accept each other as you have made us to be. Creator God, may we never forget the purpose for which you intended us to live to rest and rule creation in harmony with you forever. I pray that you will give each one of us guidance as we discover the ways in which we can be creative this year and the strength and ability to carry our creative endeavours out to completion for the sake of your kingdom and your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
uh, feel free to come up the front if you'd like some prayer. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.